about threefold, and I want to do that and move into and let the uh, that I gather and flow. But before I even do what I have been assigned to do, I would dare not be in uh, uh, Pastor Walker's house and not invoke the blessing and the presence of the resurrected Spirit of God to guide us this day. Uh, hopefully, you'll allow me to do that for those who don't bear with me. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day and for what it means to us. We certainly thank you for life. For the experiences and opportunities that you allow us to share as we come together on this your day, celebrating you through celebrating the lives and the uh, means and all of the things that you have allowed to, your children to experience in our school system. We ask the blessings upon every home represented here. We bless all of us that are being and that, that we say and do. We pray that all that we say and do will be said and done in love. That your glory will be manifested in our efforts here. And then, Holy Father, even when we don't agree, help us to agree to disagree. Yes. That your spirit will be manifested. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. My name is Raymond Privet, and I am serving as the chair of the Edgecombe County Public School Board of Education. All right. Let me set a protocol, first of all, so we we'll know who's here. And all of the, uh, first let me ask all clergy persons if you would stand. I did not do that. Clergy persons. Bless you. Thank you. All elected officials. And I probably need to break that down. Let me say all of the uh, county commissioners and board of education edge call. Stand if you will. All right. Board of Education of Nash. Let me have all of the uh, school personnel if you'll stand, if you will, please. I'd be remiss if I did not say that our fearless leader, the State Superintendent of North Carolina of the Year, Dr. Richards. <laughs> Then our deputy superintendent, Dr. Maverick, is here. I'm not sure how many have seen him. He came on board about, about January, but he's here. And so we welcome all of you, everybody else. Thank you for coming and for sharing with us today. We are here because of a very important issue and process of issues that have arisen and come to, uh, come to us. Several years ago, a few years ago, about seven, I believe, uh, we got a bill cast upon us, Title Senate Bill Number 382. Yeah. We didn't have anything to do with that, but it was cast upon us. But it had to do with us, and we have to deal with it. And that bill declared that those kids who live over in the Rocky Mountain, uh, in Rocky Mountain, the Edge Cone side, who attend the, the, the men. Rock and Rock Nash schools, that uh, we had to do something with that. And so it's our duty. And, and so we set in motion at that particular point. Uh, we got some marching orders from our commissioners to look at some options and alternatives. And if that happened, what would we do and how would we do it? And therein lies our task for today and uh, from that point on. I'm not going to go into that because as I look at the agenda, and it is a very uh, power-packed thorough agenda, I don't want to step in anybody else's way. And that's why we're here, to look at what we do with those kids who belong to us now. That they're our kids. And I know that God wants us to take them and do what the best that we can do with them. Yeah. And so that's why we're here to discuss and begin our community discussion. Now, this doesn't just start. Uh, Donnie, I'm going to talk about, he'll talk about a little later, has been working on this for, what, about two years now, a year and a half. The commissioners were kind enough to uh, give us a position so that he could begin to work, and he has begun to work. Donnie has been running to and fro and backwards and forward and all of those kinds of things. <laughs> he will not fail to let you know. If he won't talk too fast, so tell him to. Yeah, so now, yeah, yeah. 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 he comes from the Virginia area. Uh, so that's why 
he talks like that. But anyway, that's why I'm here. I'm setting the stage and setting the protocol and welcoming you. Welcome to our first gathering. One in a series of three. There's another one next week at the Rocky Mount Event Center. And there's another one at the uh, Edgecombe Community College. Right. And so we welcome you to come and share with us and to uh, share in this gathering. Uh, please provide your input. I only ask that you're, you're kind and that you're respectful to one another. As Brother Paul said, if you do things decently at all. Bless you. I think Mr. Evans is there. I'll count up. So when you look at that on a per student basis, there's a difference, there's a gap. 
that goes anywhere from 150 or as much as two or three hundred dollars per student. And when you multiply that by the 16 or 1700 students, it averages around $450,000 a year. The city of Rocky Mount had been covering that gap, right. and gladly so, up until this uh, this state statute. So starting July 1, 2020, Edgecombe County has had to take over that gap, um, that gap coverage. Also, starting July 1, 2020, the name of the school was to change from Nash Rocky Mount Schools to uh, technically, in the bill, it says Nash School Administrative Unit. I think they simply refer to it as Nash County Schools now. Um, uh, also, it said that the Nash Rock Mount School Board could not file legal action against Nash County reference funding for 10 years, so that, that would be through 2027. And finally, if Edgecombe County Fire Board of Commissioners fail to provide the required funding, it will automatically trigger a county line merger. So if our board of commissioners decided to or just forgot to or whatever, did not cover that proportionate share and that could be shown, it would automatically trigger it. We wouldn't have to take a vote on it, it would automatically happen. So that's, that, that's the main structure of that Senate Bill 382. Now, the, the biggest concern for me as the county manager, I'm working on FY23 budget right now, there's more need than we have money every year, just like it always is. And so I have to be concerned about what is, what is this going to cost Edgecombe County Senate? So since uh, 2016, when that bill was passed, um, here are some uh, new projects that the county, and, and as I mentioned before, usually our share is around 11 or 12 percent, depends on the number of students. Um, so far, uh, new construction or new capital investment that has taken place since then. There was a renovation of their early college on the Nash Community College campus. Our share of that was about $83,000. There's a new elementary school being built in Red Oak right now. Uh, it's a $20 million cost. Uh, $10 million of that is coming from lottery funds and other 10 is being financed. And so we have had, starting last year, we had to budget our share of the debt service on that. It's somewhere around $110,000. $125,000. Um, there is also plans for a new athletic field house at Northern Nash. And just last week at our joint meeting, we heard that the bids came back in at $4.7 million. So whether if they finance that or pay for it outright, we, based on this statute, would have to pay 11 or 12% of that. Uh, I understand there was some recent conversation on uh, radio program that they're they're considering building another school and, and that's fine that, that the school and the board that they have uh, facility needs and have the wherewithal to build new facilities that's that's great that's a concern for us because um, we cannot veto that and we cannot say where it's going to happen for example the elementary school in red oak um, will have few to no actual Edgecombe County residents that will attend that school. And so that, that's a concern for us. And so because of this, and, and honestly, and I, and I'm trying not to you know, uh, be leading in, in, in what I'm presenting here, but honestly, for us, Edgecombe County, we've gotten back into the corner with what we feel like is a bad piece of legislation. And so because of that, it has pushed us to reconsider, do we in fact need to consider bringing those four schools over into our school system? And so our commissioners have been discussing that for some time now. Um, we have, as has been mentioned, we have given additional funding to uh, our school system to cover the cost of a staff person. Mr. Cannon is doing a fantastic job of uh, not just should we do it if it happens, what it'll look like, but we also decided we need to we need to just discuss should we do this, and that's part that's why we're here to hear from the community. But we also need to go ahead and be thinking about if we do it, what will that look like? We cannot wait. So I know some people may think, 
Well, you're going to hear from Mr. Cannon in a few minutes. Some of you may have heard his presentation before, and it may sound like, well, you know, you make plans for what you're going to do at those, those schools and high, a high school option in the, in the city and all of that, and we haven't even decided whether or not we're going to demerge those four schools. Well, the truth of the matter is we cannot wait to make those plans until we make the decision to demerge. And, and, and if, it, if there's a decision that we don't do that, this is not time wasted because what you're going to hear in just a few minutes is dynamic. And I believe it's not only it will be a great option for the students here in uh, east side of Rocky Mount if that happens, but I think also very innovative, building on top of the innovation that has already taken place in our great school system. And we're very proud of that. So, that's sort of the context. That's why we're even having these meetings. That's why we're having these conversations. And so we are certainly glad that you are here. Our board is very much interested in hearing from the citizens here in this community that will be impacted by this. And we're grateful for you attending this program tonight, this meeting tonight. So uh, I believe I'll have to turn it over to Dr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
And so understanding what's going on in the world, how do you how are you a part of that world, and being able to advocate for yourself and for others. The third one, I can contrib contribute positive positively to my community. So you know what we're hearing now is, right? There's lots of stuff going on. We know students have had some strain from um, school closure and from being kind of separated. This is a really important one. We have to dig deep, deep. We have to find ways that we can make sure our students feel like they're a part. When you don't feel like you're a part of an organization, what do you do? You don't participate. You don't engage. That's not good for anybody. So that's some of the work that we're doing. And the fourth one, I have opportunities to return to or stay in Edge Home County. So a lot of the work that we do in our district is around economic development, getting out, making, having purposeful partnerships. How do we partner with Corning? How do we partner with Cummings? How do we partner with the Boys and Girls Club? How do we do that so that we, again, provide opportunities? You go away to college, you go to the military, you take a job, but you can also come back to Edge Home because there are opportunities here for you to have uh, a great life. Last one, I'm resilient in the face of challenges. So being resilient, we know what that's about. You keep going even when it gets hard, right? We know there are going to be challenges. We can't pretend like that won't happen. Students have to be ready for those things that are going to happen in life, and we want to make sure that our kids can handle it, that they know when to, to dig a little deeper, they know when and where to get help and support from, because you don't you don't come to this world knowing how to do that. That's our job to come to figure it out. Okay? So though again, those are our graduate aims. My favorite part about the graduate aims is it says by the time you're 25. Students graduate from high school at 17, 18, maybe 19, not 25. What we're saying in Edgecombe is we're going to still hold on, we're going to check on you, we're going to support you until you're age 25. Now, I have to only think back a few years. Now, some of you may have to think back further than you did. I'm just saying. So, you know, when you graduate 18 years old, you, of course, our students think they're grown, right? They think they're adults. They are technically adults, but 25 is when we feel like you've had enough time to figure out some things, to make some mistakes, to kind of do things the right way. And so we feel like as a school system, 25 is the right age for us to be able to say they're ready, they got it, they're, they're moving in the right direction. So again, that to 25. Now, you may not be able to see this, but these are some, these are, thank you, these are some pieces that I just really want us to lean into, and I don't worry about it. If you get it, I'll, I'll keep going, you can keep trying. So I just want us to lean into a few things if you can't see it, but I'll talk you through it. Mm -hmm. So the first piece of innovation that we're talking about on the screen says Martin Millennium Academy is a K-8 global in Spanish immersion. And so what I want to share about that is we started global education in Edgecombe, um, I think around 2015. We have students now who will be leaving from high school. Um, they've got one more year as far as being a part of that Spanish immersion. That wasn't really heard of in East North Carolina at the time that we tried it. Um, we've had some increasing enrollments in Edgecombe County Public Schools because we offered, again, opportunities, things that students will find exciting. Parents were excited to be a part of that. So as a, um, we, we started with kindergarten and first grade, and they were able to learn Spanish. Our other students who chose not to, to learn the language or their parents didn't sign them up, they still got an opportunity to learn by global. And so, again, these are opportunities that we want to share with our students. We want them to be able to participate. We are looking now at what's next. So those students who will be graduating from middle school going into high school, what are the extended opportunities they can have for being K-8 global and Spanish immersion? When we look at our data from our Millennium Academy, we see that data. They've exceeded growth. They continue to, to kind of ramp up what's happening there. We know that good learning and good education is happening um, at our Millennium. The next one is opportunity culture. So opportunity culture is, and I call it common sense. It's a, it's a, um, it's a formula where a teacher with a proven track record, this teacher has been successful in the classroom. She's had great results academically for students, the teacher goes in and she partners, she shares space with the teacher who's not, who's maybe not in the same space she is, 
with her students. She builds relationships. She helps the teacher um, with classroom management. She helps the teacher with content. And so that's one other um, piece of innovation that we use in EDUCOM is that we have teachers who are part of something called Opportunity Culture. They take on a little more students. They help um, other staff members to get better at their craft. And for doing that, we give them a little extra money for, for being able to do that. So they have a little stipend that comes along with that. Again, that's one of the pieces that we feel like we in the place that's in EDUCOM that has helped our students and helped our schools to progress. Restart schools. You all probably have heard about this from DPI. We started in the EDUCOM with three restart schools, north side of our school system. Coach Wembley Phillips is North. We start with restart. It gives some flexibility to the schools related to curriculum and budget and staffing. And so again, utilizing what's available to make sure that in edge home students have some other options. Since we, we did start with the first three schools, we added one additional school. So we have four schools in edge home that are restart schools. And then the last piece that you see here is North Phillips School of Innovation. It started off as a micro school. We started with eighth and ninth graders, eighth graders at Phillips, ninth graders at North. We um, 30 students, and we just did a whole new redesign of what school could look like. We weren't sure what it was going to turn out to look like, what it was going to feel like, um, it was going to work for our students, but we wanted to give it a chance because we felt like students needed an opportunity again to figure out what are they passionate about, what they care about, what matters most to them. It worked so well that we had extended that, and now there's a 612 model for Phillips and for North. So those two feeder pattern schools, um, we see, we've seen dramatic increase in student achievement, attendance, and a sense of belonging. So again, I, I wanted to share with you one of the things in EDGECOM that we've done that have worked, that have helped us to, um, to continue to improve. When you hear um, from Mr. Cannon, um, you'll hear that if the, if the demerger and we, we have 1,800 students come to Edge Home, our intention is not to do business as usual. Okay? Our intention is to do things that would provide opportunities for students and to make sure that our students could be successful. Will it take some time? All of these took time. Okay? The first year wasn't perfect. We had to tweak, we had to figure it out. We had to make sure we had the right staff to make sure that this would work for students. But again, it takes time. Um, and we appreciate our county commissioners because they did allow us to have one position to be the end of the process. And they also said to us, we will give you the time to get it right because you've done it before. You've proven yourself and you've done this before. So that's where we are um, with kind of some of the work that has happened in the Home that has made us successful. I'm going to stop there. And I'm going to ask Mr. Cannon um, to come up, but before he comes up, what I want to share with you is um, Mr. Cannon has served as our executive director. He started uh, July 1 of last year, so he's coming up in one full year, and he's been out and about everywhere, right? He's talked to a lot of people and had lots of conversations, but before becoming our executive director, um, Mr. Cannon was principal in our North High School.
topics. And then secondly, read the room. I know folks got a lot of questions. We've heard a lot of things, so we're gonna push us as fast as we can so that we can we can get to some discussion. I'm sure this will probably be up. Um, so much gratitude to our our uh, Edgewater County um, Public Schools Board of Education and Dr. B our commissioners for trusting me to lead this way. Um, it's been a really exciting last few months, and I'm really excited to share with you just kind of what I've been up to. So the essence of my role right now is to, as, as many of you know, Edgewater County we don't have much of a footprint yet, um, and in the Rocky Mountain. And so my job has been, one, to get to know the family, get to know context, get to know the young people that are in the communities, and learn more about like what they want, what they want most, what they want less of, less of, what they want more of. So finding out how do I get in the living rooms, how do I get on front porches, to become kinfolk, to really learn up close, just like what parents want to be true. And what we know in the way we design schools for so long is that we create models, we create structures that are absent of the voices of young people. So, um, so one of our, our majority, our main play has been, how do we move closer? And so that's what I've been up to for the last few months. And using what we're learning, so all the key insights, all the conversations from our young people, our families, community members, to feed back to our county commissioners and our, and our board, our superintendent, to help guide our pathway forward, right? To help determine if the demerger is the best way to go. And so it's really exciting because I see, hey y'all, uh, it's really exciting because I see a lot of folks in the room that I've had an opportunity to speak with. And so some of the things that you're about to see in just a second, it's just like some uh, formation of some of the insights that you have shared. Um, um, and so we're really excited to get to that. But again, those who contributed to this thus far, those who like uh, joined the empathy interviews, whether it was the front porches or coffee shops, whatever it has been, I'm grateful. This doesn't stop. We'll keep the same cycle. Like we're gonna keep listening and keep learning so that we can continue to shape like what a pathway forward looks like. One thing I will also add is that if, if Santa Dumer doesn't happen, like this is all this is not just you know like uh, in vain. Like we're gonna take what we're learning about like what young people want and help to build out um, the, the work that's happening in Edgecombe that's taking root in Edgecombe currently and to continue to extend the work that we're that, um, that we're leading young people in uh, the diagnostic system. So really excited to share. So um, I just want to kind of see like the process we've been using to kind of um, map our pathway forward. Um, so we used this at North at so we got really good at building out this muscle, like learning uh, how do we sit in like a liberatory design. So what this means is like how do we start with people first? Um, so not moving straight for design and saying like this is what school system will look like, or this is what school will be. And we've seen implications of that, whether that's in school or like across society, right? And so we don't want to mark that in the same way. So we're we spend a lot of time sitting in empathy, like really learning. So this is a called a liberatory design which takes in the needs of like the people and then builds it all the way around. So like, you, you learn as much as you can from folks, then you start to dream boldly, you take your insights and say like, what am I, like what can we learn from this? Like what are people saying and why I need? So we take that and launch us forward. And then we start to build. So literally just sit in a bunch of room, uh, sit in a room with a bunch of sticky notes and say, hmm, Ms. King said this, but that connects to what Ms. Avon said, which connects to what Tristan said, that's a big insight. And so we just map these things all across the board. So like our board is really messy. So again, trying to figure out like, how do we elevate the voice of parents, community members, and our, and, our, and our young people as we design the model. And then we'll get to this part, which is like, we try it out. So if there were like the merger were to happen, and we were to, we have how to go ahead, one, we already have things packaged, like based on what families are telling us, but then we're also able to like start to try a lot of these ideas in our schools. So it's like a pilot some of these ideas. And we'll keep the ones that are really sticky for the trial of truth, right? So that's kind of, I wanted to share this process of we're using. So like, again, we're talking about what it's even up to, last year, well, a lot of the fall is just like sitting with people learning as much as we can, collecting the insights to help map our path forward. So that's kind of where we are. So where we've been so far, so conducted about 134 face-to-face -face interviews. So been able to like get in front of folks with his mamas and dads and grandparents and young people, and just ask them, what do you want to be true to, like, in your experience? What, do you, what don't you like in your school? What do you wish you had more of? Like, what are your bold um, dreams for the future? And how do we map school around that? Like, what do you want to be up to in school? And we use that as a place of design. So we're designing with people and not for people. So I've been able to accomplish about 134 interviews. Just to give context, like somebody might see it as like a small number, but 134 interviews, like, we, we try to mark out like two hours of conversation so that folks feel really heard and listened to and care for you. 
And so we're capturing everything they're saying so that we can use that when we start to populate like big ideas. We're also been on like 12 different inspiration videos. Um, so we took a few folks in the community with us to one in New York, which was really exciting. We took a bunch of some mamas and uh, some community members out to New York to see some exciting new models. So essentially, how we think about inspiration business is like, we got a lot to learn, right? And so like, who is out there doing it best? So we're not afraid to like, to go be a student for a while. So we went to New York to figure out what they're doing best in New York so we can figure out like, how to bring that Rocky Mountain, right? We, like Rocky Mountain, obviously like, we offer significant morality, but that does not mean that we can't do things that are really expansive for young people. So we took a, a few moms, grandparents, or a, a few folks out, dads out to New York to see some really cool special models uh, out, of, out of the Bronx and out of Brooklyn, which is really exciting. But essentially, how we think about inspiration business, so Mr. Avid might say, well, I know that I, my granddaughter talks about like school of arts, like wanting to engage in arts, for the graphic arts, dance, and all the things. So we'll say, who's doing that best, whether like in our area or beyond? So I'll go to so I'll go to Sally, um, so I'll be out. So to see like, how they're doing it, how they're making it happen. Think that's what we're talking about. There you go. Um, so just see how it's happening, how they're doing it, what things they've got to be really successful, what things happen. And we're taking up insights and adding to like our, our big wallpaper, right? Like, so we can come up with big ideas. So moms might say, like, well, I think my kid really is excited about their passion. They want to build their passion, and schools don't focus on that more. So it's like, who's doing passion-based work really well? And let's go see it. So we've been chasing ideas for the past few months. So we've been in New York. Been to Rhode Island, been to Seattle, just collecting all the things so we can bring back and design for, for young people in our, in our, in our, in our county. Um, and so some of them, again, have been local, like local schools in, the, in this area. So we want to wait county here in our own school district, who are like folks who are up doing big things and try to learn from all the work that, that's taken over here. So that's kind of uh, my inspiration with this. Now, what does that lead me to like design? Now, what you're about to see again is it's still loose, right? Like we are still building it along the way, so we're still taking, that's why I have a sign-in sheet back there. So like, put your name, email, if you want to meet me, like, I'd be I happy to kind of like, talk with you and learn about what you want to be true for your young people. So we keep pulling that into this. So again, in the event that, like, our county commissioners say, like, this is going to happen, we have a runway. Like, we know what we're going to be working towards. So it doesn't seem like things are, are happening to put together and rush for young people, because kids don't deserve that, right? They deserve something bold and special. <laughs> And so you probably can't see this, so I'll, so I'll talk to it because the text is really small. But again, this, which are, so this is one draft of two options. And I, this has come by way of like the voices, like what folks are saying they want for young people. So just give you some ideas. So in just a second, when you think about the best possible school in, in Rocky Mountain, like New York from here in Rocky Mountain, right? So this is what we want for, like excited being you. So we have about 400 young people that might transition over in the case of it, like the demerger. Um, Emerging. So there's a lot of conversation on here from parents. And parents are saying, we want our own high school. Right? They're saying like we don't want to go to this school, and that school, we want our own design, we want to go special, we want their own model. So they let us like start to populate a bunch of things. So parents are like, I want passion, I want this based thing, I want this thing. And so Dr. B.I. and Aaron looked at the chart and said, like, how do we make all these things happen? Or can we make all these things happen? And then we just went to vote and said, let's try to make all of it happen, which I believe we can. So essentially, the, the seven, we would have a school about seven, seven to all, so grade seven to all. Um, the significant research says what happens when we limit the amount of transition that students like, have throughout their, throughout their, their uh, school experience, like the, the, the type of um, the impact that it has on young people. And so we'll go to seven to all grade band, all under one singular hub. But this hub of school has five different micro schools. So we try to start learning significantly um, and North Edge, I want to shout out my two folks who have helped me with that work for the last year. And what we found is that we could do something very special, very unique for each kid in that micro school. So, Mr. Aiden, you said you want a school of the arts. Boom, we have our own micro school of the arts. We said we have a school of technology, and engineering, and advanced technology. That's kind of what we're hearing from like industry leaders who said, like, this is where the, the industry is going. Um, here, we want a school of. Um, an early college, which is already in work, so we want to bring an early college here to Rocky Mountain, so the students in Rocky Mountain have their own early college um, in East Side of Rocky Mountain, and right, right in downtown. And then uh, we have a school of entrepreneurship and innovation. So idea is like learning from folks in the community. Folks are saying that like, you know what, the businesses have left this place, right? And we don't see them coming back. So we started to think like, hmm, what if we put our own young people to, 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 to grow their own business? But they don't do it without support, right? They do it in our schools. 
So each one of these will have, the kids would have like a very specific time to focus on these passions, focus on the things that happen in the school, but we wrap the learning around that. So essentially, we have one advisor to help, that will support us through build their, their individual learning plan. Students have part of their day is in the micro school where they learn specifically the skills and passions. They do part of their day in a full long internship where they're just like, have a mentor. So say the kid's like, I want to have a coffee shop. And it's like, okay, like, let's, what are the types of internship rotations or mentorship-based rotations a kid would need to have access to to build the muscle necessary to do this well when they're 18? And so we would wrap with the science, the English, and the social studies in their individual learning plans. So each kid would have an advisor, and that advisor would follow you and loop you from seventh grade all the way to 12th grade. So the kid knows you deeply. He knows your mom and your grandma, and I've been at all these big time life events, knows all the small moments, all the big moments that happen in your life, which you want to be true, and can guide that in the individual learning plan. So we can figure out how the competencies are built through the internship experience. So it be a full out model. Kids will be in their internship two or three days a week. So if kids said, I want to be, I want to be a barista on a, on a coffee shop, then we said, kid probably needs a real estate rotation. The kid needs to actually spend some time in a coffee shop to figure out how to operationalize that. Mm -hmm. And so we will move you in that experience two days a week. Your advisor will work with your mentor to make sure you're learning this same stuff, uh, make sure you're getting what you need. The only thing we'll teach separately in these micro schools would be like math. We realized that like, it's hard to create the dosage of math in the individual learning plan. So we have a math teacher who helps support those unique skills. Mm -hmm. um, and we are already testing a lot of that work and those ideas, concepts in a small way over at uh, North Edge Home, which is really exciting in terms. And again, what we ultimately want is kids raising their hand and say, my Jordan's about to dead, I'm hopping in them, and I'm running to the bus, because like those people are killing it for us, right? So that's what we want for, for the kids in our community. So the, the folks on this model, kids would have, um, each kid would leave with college access, with, with, with college application in hand, so they have all the credits necessary for that. But then also, kids would leave college uh, work first grade, where kids would have like all their certifications necessary to move into their career right away. So one kid have both of those things and not be limited by uh, any, anything, right? So again, so we had to think about like, what do we want to be, like how do we back this map out that to create a whole experience across the community? So we um, started thinking about this alternative pathway to school. So the alternative pathway to school, like what does school not work for? Like what kids across our district, elementary school to high school, the school not work for? This is the scholars right now absolutely enjoy virtual school. We don't want to disrupt that because they're doing well. So like, how do we support that group of students? We have young people in our schools right now who are dropping out. Because they have, they have, they're a young person who have a young person, right? So they, they, they have a baby and can't go head engage in school, so they, they drop out. So we talked about like, what does it look like to have multiple entry points for students throughout the day? So students come in the morning, we have some afternoon schedules, and we have some evening schedules. Like, to give kids flex time so that we can make sure that every kid gets exactly what they need to be successful. Um, and, we, and then, so we talked about like how offering ESL classes at an alternative pathway school in East Rock Mall. So it's like compared to um, our native like us, um, Spanish speakers, like how do we support them like learning English, right? And that's only one reference point. So obviously, there are a number of like uh, cases that we can support here. GD. So like we, we work with, we talk with um, Dr. McLeod at early college. So they're dreaming about what does it look like to give parents access to, to, to GD programs across the community. So that they can socially mobilize, so they can do good things for their young people, and our beds and community changes over time, right? And so, work with them instead of be willing to offer that if we were to start something like this. But then also, who are our young people who drop out from 16 to 24, 25? Those are still our babies as part of our, our strategic plan, right? This is part of how we see, like, us, like how we show them the work. So, we offer GD programs for those, for those children. We have apprenticeships for kids who like, are in, in real alternative school, and we realize that, like, we, we, we kick those kids out of school, those kids need a little bit more love. Or essentially, like, school just doesn't work for them. And we got to design a school that does. So we talked, like, so this one will have an apprenticeship program for those students who are making hard money while also learning. And then also, like, how we catch kids up to get them every, all their academic credits so they can get out of school. Because keeping them in school, it obviously just won't work. And so this would be like a catch all experience. Essentially, you would think of this as like a Walmart school where kids get everything they need. Like, so literally, what a subset of kids in school are working for, here's, you have, uh, you have access to this particular program. That's how we're thinking about that. Um, zero to kindergarten uh, signature experiences. We've been looking at some quantitative data. Some of the quantitative data revealed that some of the students in the area, like 70% are ready for kindergarten. And that's something hard we gotta, we gotta grapple with, right, when students aren't successful out of the box. 
But then now it doesn't compound all the time. And we can't ever expect like, really big outcomes for young people uh, if that's true. Right? Teachers have a hard time like, trying to catch kids up. It's, it's tough. So we thought about what are experiences that students need to have to prepare for the rest of kindergarten. So we started mapping out a zero, a kin, a zero from birth to kindergarten experience. Realize that students' brains grow like 80% within the first three years of their life. So even by the time we get kids in our pre-K programs, kids are already behind, right? Because they haven't had the learning experiences necessary in the early years. And so we have to like, pay critical attention to that. And so what we thought about is like, what are we going to be, right? And we were like, what are we, can we do child care for all and pay for it? And we ran that idea for a little bit and then realized that it was really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> so that was about like for us, $1.5 million for like 100 kids. And so we had to abort really fast. Uh, but we came up with some really cool models. So um, Aaron and I, we were thinking about what's it like to have like our own community do this, right? So like if a parent has their own baby born, like how do we have four different folks, five different people in the community who are teachers who are ready to be there at the door to say, Give the type of learning experience your kid you have. We teach your kid a few times a week. We teach these learning experiences and help prepare that student for, for kindergarten. We also uh, we have to raise some money for, for pre, more pre K classrooms for three year olds. Right now, we have funding models for four year olds, like using um, some of like our Title I and, and some other some, um, AC pre K funding. We can do classrooms for four year olds. As I mentioned, research reveals that four year olds are just too late, right? Especially kids aren't getting the nurturing, the type of things they need in the early years. They were already behind. So we're talking about adding like a few more pre K, pre year pre old classes in this particular community to get kids like the footing they need to be really successful. Okay. Um, and then we, like, we, we have parent, uh, parent learning labs so parents really understand how kids learn best. We've been living a lot in that research, but student parents can come in and see learning take place in the early years so they can better support learning at home. Um, we came with this idea where we're, we're running not just for East, but for the Rocky Mountain community, but in our own community. We're trying to figure out how to build parents as literacy specialists, pay parents to do that work, and they build other literacy specialists within the community. So like folks in the community are really empowered to do that work themselves from a community of like folks who understand reading well and know how to teach kids reading. So that's an idea we're currently uh, attempting to change. A specialized support people, you know like the impact of like trauma on students uh, who, who usually need additional dose. So we recognize like what we'll need to, to up the game. And we really believe that, like, one, we can do this also on our own funding, and then two, we make big ask, um, like, to folks who are, like, really want to get stuff like this, want to get something really exciting, to build this, this, this funding for this. And then lastly, we have a, a, a grade six through, first, uh, first through six experience. So again, limiting kids, limiting kids transition, first grade to sixth grade can also be clustered together. Some of this is what we're learning from, like, a lot of the learning science. And then, um, so a lot of that model, kids have an experiential learning experience once a week. That best compare kids from a seventh grade experience. So essentially, like fifth graders were going on Friday, learning about the elements there. The, the, the learning is incorporated through that experience. Really get kids out of the classroom, build muscle, build their passions. And so, again, this is, you can see this is like a way to build students up to the types of fluid uh, experience they have at a high school level. And so, again, like teaching compassion and empathy and self regulation. Um, we looked at the science of work, we realized that, like, automated. Technology on things are gonna like dominate a lot of the workforce. So like how do we best prepare kids to like to do the thing that computers can right? And so we're gonna build a lot of that, sit a lot of that into the early learning so kids are prepared to, to run, to take a run when they're out when they're when they're seven. So again, we're trying to build off of experience. And again, none of this is arbitrary, like meaning like I'm just not like, let's do that for young people, right? Like sit in the coffee shop and listen to Aiden because Aiden says this. I'm running with it, right? Like, we're trying to pair this idea to see where, where they're coming up a number of times, and that's how we're building the need for the model. And um, again, the sign sheet, if like, you just want to sit and talk, I'll come to your living room. Hopefully, you got some food. If I'm not, it's okay, I want to get you. And, and we can talk about the stuff, so we keep like adding more texture to it, um, to get out forward. So, the thing that our commissioners say that like this is going to happen, we're not struggling to figure it out. Right, we already have like a, a full, a, a full attack tool of all the things that we could do for the young people that do not in Rock Island. They deserve like better than like the workforce in many ways than what they've got. So that's where we are. We have a design team, so it's not so we have folks in the community who we meet once a month and we talk about these things. So we put the ideas in front of them, they give us feedback, and we go back and sit them up and meet once a month. And some of these folks are uh, are in the room. Um, and if you really quick, I know we have two design folks, design team members in the room. Raise your hand. 
Perfect. And we have some, our parents have been, some, oh, that some of them not in room two. But these are folks who are sitting at a table and just all trying to figure all this out to create a beautiful design. So that's what we are. But you can all, you heard a whole lot. And I, hopefully I, I didn't talk as fast. <laughs> and cool, so you heard a lot. So how about, how about um, the car? I know we're a little bit behind time, um, but how about 10 minutes for folks to react to what you just heard? So like, are there questions that, you, that you're holding on to that you want to ask? We're going to, here's a space for you to ask those things. And then we're going to shut that down after 10 minutes because we have table facilitators at each table. And those table facilitators are going like, to um, take notes so that we can capture all of your insights, so that we can deliver that back to our county commissioners to better help them make a decision regarding what's up next. And, we, and for the folks who are like, actually don't want to talk, we have in-depth talks. So, but um, can I take the to raise your hand so folks know who you are? Sweet. Sweet. Perfect. Thank you. Cool. So we're, we're going to have a few questions, and then we're going to write to the, to the discussion at the tables so that we can gather as much insight as possible. Sweet, so what questions do you have? Um, just add it to Dr. Bebeck. Speaking on behalf of Baskerville, something we did right here at Ben and Baskerville. These two kids right here at Ben and Baskerville are in kindergarten. The school is not me. It's achievement. Because they match, they are behind.
that the children can attend so they don't have to experience some type of long-range busing. I mean, that sounds like something back in the era when we were just um, desegregated about 100 years ago. So what uh, accountability is going to be applied so that Edgecombe County, Rocky Mountain, Edgecombe County children do not lose the value of the dollars that have already been put out there? Sure, so I think um, one of the things that I hope that comes out of this process, even if we don't emerge, is I hope this um, rejuvenates an interest from the community to be more active and pay more attention to your schools. As far as uh, money that's invested, how those schools are prioritized or not, and so I think, you know, that's, that's a question to ask of, of the Nash County leadership. Now, I will say that if, if this does happen, then it becomes the responsibility for local school as far as the facilities, the responsibility of our commissioners, and the responsibility of our school board to educate those students. That's something that we're already thinking about, as you've heard Mr. Cannon mention earlier. In looking at the possibilities of how we educate these kids if we emerge, um, you know, obviously we have three high schools now in, in Edgecombe County, and I don't think either of the three are at capacity. So we have room to move those 400 or so high school students in one of those uh, three schools, but we understand that that's, first of all, probably not what this community wants, and probably not what's best for this, those students. And so that's why we're exploring um, a high school option here inside the city limits. Um, he mentioned earlier that there's already work undergoing, undergoing right now to, um, to get a, an early college uh, here on the community college, Edgecombe Community College campus in Rocky Mountain. There's already one in Tarver. But also looking at how we can create a high school option here, and we're even exploring possibilities of facilities here in downtown. So, you know, we see it, if it's an action that this board takes, we see it as big very important as to how we handle those facilities and how we create an option for the high school students here. And I, I asked Mr. Kent to put back up the slide. I don't know if you want to talk, talk about the location. I think you just kind of briefly said that. Yeah, yeah. So um, to that end, again, we've been hearing from parents, uh, young people, that obviously they want to go high school. Um, that seems to be really important if that's this were happening. So we have been exploring like, what, what does it look like to have a facility that's downtown? Um, so we've been exploring a few downtown options with hopes that we would um, kind of like reinvigorate like like buildings, essentially create a state-of-the-art facility for students, where students have a kind of even flow to the downtown type of experience that allows students to easily engage their internships. And we've talked about that a little bit more, but we hear you loud and clear, and we got, we're hopeful that if this happens, that we pursue an option that feels really good for students, feels really different, and it like pushes us towards like, the, like what the future should be. I want to add to that. We also understand that uh, if this happens and when it happens, that those students that will be uh, you know, rising freshmen at high school that they're already planning to go, that may be important for them to be able to continue on that path in that high school. So our, our board, we talk about um, you know providing a transition period where where those students will be able to go ahead and, uh, and, and matriculate through the high school, right now high school. Uh, here, if they want to, if we make those. I'm going to grab Cal and I'm going to grab him, and then we're going to go to bring out into discussion. Um, so we'll capture a lot of this conversation there. And we'll have share out after so that we can hear some of the things that folks are talking about. So Cal and I'm going to grab him. At this point in the demerge or possible demerge process, is there any outside of the room for certain council members and school board members? Is there any power that the parents and community have with input? the decision or is it at this point based on whatever the commissioners vote, the school board votes, and we hope that we can have influence on the results. Um, where is our power in this right now? So, so your, your power is right now. This is the opportunity to express as a community, as an individual, uh, whether it be through these forms, there is a survey that's been asked for some time, Mr. Cannon will share in just a minute. Um, so now is the time that there's one reason we want to partner with our, our friends in the school system to have these meetings because our board wants to hear. 
Now we, we have some commissioners that have publicly expressed that they don't think we should do it. We have some commissioners that have publicly expressed that they think it's what we should do. Our board has not made taken up any kind of vote on that. They had a few discussions, they've not taken a vote. Um, but th this is where you have power now. We need to, if we, through these three meetings, hear an overwhelming voice that this is what we should do, that's going to ring very powerfully in the ears of our commissioners. Conversely, if we hear an overwhelming voice, uh, this is the worst thing you do, you shouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole, that will ring very loudly in the ears of our commissioners. So, and then one of the questions on the survey asked very directly, are you in favor of this? And so that, that now we get a lot of feedback from that report, and we're looking at the commentary, looking at all the things, well, I'm sitting at the desk like, oh, let's take this in, so that we can get an all time down to and help them better make a decision. Also, in this space here, so as we bring up the discussions, Please share boldly, please share. Um, we're gonna take the facilitators, but we're also taking that, add it to that survey data so we can continue uh, to support our contribution and make a decision that feels right for, for you. Uh, and Reverend Hanks, I want to you. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I come from the far end of the county. Uh, I live out of speed, probably next to uh, Hasback. That's why I was born in the city of Rock, Hasback. So then later on, we came more so to Eshcom. And I'm a strong advocate that whatever you do for one child in Eshcom, you do it for every child in Eshcom. Now, I hear what was shared at the retreat, I hear what was shared at the other meeting. But to me, Senate Bill 382 is the driving force of why we're here. And I think until we can get these questions answered, I'm a military guy, so we, we, we do we call strategic planning. If you do this, you do that, you know what that's going to be. So I think we need to, number one, determine where we are. Now once you determine where you are, you need to determine how did you get here? And then you determine where are you going, how are you going, and when are you going. In short, by answering those questions, what y'all shared, the, the, the vision right, the Senate Bill 382 didn't exist. You're going back tomorrow, and you're going to try to input those ideas and stuff that you learned out of state into the current system. That's fine. But there need to be some concrete effort addressing Senate Bill 382. And I don't bite my tongue. The outcome of Senate Bill 382 probably would have been a little different if the Ashcombe County commissioners had stayed at the table and participated. They shut down, and when they shut down, Nash County moved forward and got what we have today. A prime example, there was communication that if and when this happened, Nash County agreed, Edgecombe agreed, that the kids that was in the ninth grade through the 12th, if they wanted to stay in the system, they will be given that opportunity both systems thought that was right to do. But then communication broke down. And nobody seemed to remember this. What broke down the communication was when Edgecombe wanted Rock and Mount to come to the table, and Rock and Mount came to the table, and Andre Knight sitting at me and read a letter that he said was written by the Ku Club Klan, and Belfield offered a plan that he thought would bounce us out. And, and Andre told uh, Belfield that the plan that he was presented was worse than the now that he just read. And, and everybody walked away from the table. See, I know that. Everybody else knows that too. Yeah, thank you. Well, I was going to say thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, I'm sure there, are some, there might be some reactions to that. Uh, they don't have to. Uh, but but I, there wasn't a question there. So I, so I, I want to uh, move over so we can get the conversation started uh, at the table so we can get from everyone in the room. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Chairman. Yeah.
Um, table facilitators. We're, I'm sorry, table facilitators have a few guiding questions. Some of those questions are directly asked, um, they'll get us closer to the types of information that commissioners are going to need to kind of guide a decision, um, or to make a decision rather. So I have our, our, our table facilitators at each table. Um, we're going to engage in discussions for about 15 minutes. I get more time on time. So if you, you guys need to roll out, then like, we, we get that too. Um, but we're going to engage in some of these conversations. And at each table, there is a, a survey alongside that. We won't be taking a good roll out. But by table facilitators, if you can kind of like get in like, what clusters of reports are, so we can ask some of these questions.